The Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. Chapter 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. Edited by Frank Woodworth Pine. Chapter 4. First Visit to Boston. Sir William Keith, governor of the province, was then at Newcastle, and Captain Holmes, happening to be in company with him when my letter came to hand, spoke to him of me, and showed him the letter. The governor read it, and seemed surprised when he was told my age. He said I appeared a young man of promising parts, and therefore should be encouraged. The printers of Philadelphia were wretched ones, and if I could set up there, he made no doubt I should succeed. For his part, he would procure me the public business, and do me every other service in his power. This my brother-in-law afterwards told me in Boston, but I knew as yet nothing of it when, one day, Keimer and I, being at work together near the window, we saw the governor and another gentleman, which proved to be Colonel French of Newcastle, finely dressed, come directly across the street to our house, and heard them at the door. Keimer ran down immediately, thinking it a visit to him. But the governor inquired for me, came up, and with a condescension and politeness I had been quite unused to, made me many compliments, desired to be acquainted with me, blamed me kindly for not having made myself known to him when I first came to the place, and would have me away with him to the tavern, where he was going with Colonel French, to taste, as he said, some excellent Madeira. I was not a little surprised, and Keimer stared like a pig poisoned. I went, however, with the governor and Colonel French to a tavern, at the corner of Third Street, and over the Madeira he proposed my setting up my business, laid before me the probabilities of success, and both he and Colonel French assured me I should have their interest and influence in procuring the public business of both governments. On my doubting whether my father would assist me in it, Sir William said he would give me a letter to him, in which he would state the advantages, and he did not doubt of prevailing with him. So it was concluded I should return to Boston in the first vessel, with the governor's letter recommending me to my father. In the meantime, the intention was to keep a secret, and I went on working with Keimer as usual the governor sending for me now and then to dine with him, a very great honour I thought it, and conversing with me in the most affable, familiar, and friendly manner imaginable. About the end of April 1724 a little vessel offered for Boston. I took leave of Keimer, as going to see my friends. The governor gave me an ample letter, saying many flattering things of me to my father, and strongly recommending the project of my setting up in Philadelphia as a thing that must make my fortune. We struck on a shoal in going down the bay, and sprung a leak. We had a blistering time at sea, and were obliged to pump almost continuously, at which I took my turn. We arrived safe, however, at Boston in about a fortnight. I had been absent seven months, and my friends had heard nothing of me, for my brother Holmes was not yet returned, and had not written about me. My unexpected appearance surprised the family. All were, however, very glad to see me, and made me welcome, except my brother. I went to see him at his printing-house. I was better dressed than ever while in his service, having a genteel new suit from head to foot, a watch, and my pockets lined with near five pounds sterling in silver. He received me not very frankly, looked me all over, and turned to his work again. The journeymen were inquisitive where I had been, what sort of a country it was, and how I liked it. I praised it much, the happy life I led in it, expressing strongly my intention of returning to it, and one of them asked what kind of money we had there. I produced a handful of silver, and spread it before them, which was a kind of rarey show, a peep show in a box. They had not been used to, paper money being the money of Boston. Begin footnote, there were no mints in the colonies, so the metal money was of foreign coinage, and not nearly so common as paper money, which was printed in large quantities in America, even in small denominations. End footnote. 
then i took the opportunity of letting them see my watch and lastly my brother still grum and sullen i gave them a piece of eight spanish dollar about equivalent to our dollar to drink and took my leave this visit of mine offended him extremely for when my mother some time after spoke to him of a reconciliation and of her wishes to see us on good terms together and that we might live for the future as brothers he said i had insulted him in such a manner before his people that he could never forget or forgive it in this however he was mistaken my father received the governor's letter with some apparent surprise but said little of it to me for some days when captain holmes returned he showed it to him and asked him if he knew keith and what kind of man he was adding his opinion that he must be of small discretion to think of setting a boy up in a business who wanted yet three years of being a man's estate holmes said what he could in favour of the project but my father was clear in the impropriety of it and at last gave a flat denial to it then he wrote a civil letter to sir william thanking him for the patronage he had so kindly offered me but declining to assist me as yet in setting up i being in his opinion too young to be trusted with the management of a business so important and for which the preparation must be so expensive my friend and companion collins who was a clerk in the post office pleased with the account i gave him of my new country determined to go thither also and while i waited for my father's determination he set out before me by land to rhode island leaving his books which were a pretty collection of mathematics and natural philosophy to come with mine and me to new york where he proposed to wait for me my father though he did not approve sir william's proposition was yet pleased that i had been able to obtain so advantageous a character from a person of such note where i had resided and that i had been so industrious and careful as to equip myself so handsomely in so short a time therefore seeing no prospect of an accommodation between my brother and me he gave his consent to my returning again to philadelphia advised me to behave respectfully to the people there endeavouring to obtain the general esteem and avoid lampooning and libelling to which he thought i had too much inclination telling me that by steady industry and a prudent parsimony i might save enough by the time i was twenty and one to set me up and that if i came near the matter he would help me out with the rest this was all i could obtain except some small gifts as tokens of his and my mother's love when i embarked again for new york now with their approbation and their blessing the sloop putting in at newport rhode island i visited my brother john who had been married and settled there some years he received me very affectionately for he always loved me a friend of his one vernon having some money due him in philadelphia about thirty five pounds currency desired that i would receive it for him and keep it till i had his directions what to remit it in accordingly he gave me an order this afterwards occasioned me a good deal of uneasiness at newport we took a number of passengers for new york among which were two young women companions and a grave sensible matron-like quaker woman with her attendants i had shown an obliging readiness to do her some little services which impressed her i suppose with a degree of good will toward me therefore when she saw a daily growing familiarity between me and the two young women which they appeared to encourage she took me aside and said young man i am concerned for thee as thou hast no friend in thee and seems not to know much of the world or of the snares youth is exposed to depend upon it those are very bad women i can see it in all their actions and if thee art not upon thy guard they will draw thee into some danger they are strangers to thee and i advise thee in a friendly concern for thy welfare to have no acquaintance with them as i seemed at first not to think so ill of them as she did she mentioned some things she had observed and heard that had escaped my notice what now convinced me she was right i thanked her for her kind advice and promised to follow it when we arrived at new york they told me where they lived and invited me to come and see them but i avoided it and it was well i did for the next day the captain missed a silver spoon and some other things that had been taken out of his cabin 
and knowing that these were a couple of strumpets, he got a warrant to search their lodgings, found the stolen goods, and had the thieves punished. So, though we had escaped a sunken rock, which we scraped upon in the passage, I thought this escapade of rather more importance to me. At New York I found my friend Collins, who had arrived there some time before me. We had been intimate from children, and had read the same books together, but he had the advantage of more time for reading and studying, and a wonderful genius for mathematical learning, in which he far outstripped me. While I lived in Boston, most of my hours of leisure for conversation were spent with him, and he continued a sober as well as an industrious lad, was much respected for his learning by several of the clergy and other gentlemen, and seemed to promise making a good figure in life. But during my absence he had acquired a habit of sotting with brandy, and I found by his own account, and what I heard from others, that he had been drunk every day since his arrival in New York, and behaved very oddly. He had gamed, too, and lost his money, so that I was obliged to discharge his lodgings, and defray his expenses to and at Philadelphia, which proved extremely inconvenient to me. The governor of New York, Burnett, son of Bishop Burnett, hearing from the captain that a young man, one of his passengers, had a great many books, desired he would bring me to see him. I waited upon him accordingly, and should have taken Collins with me, but that he was not sober. The governor treated me with great civility, showed me his library, which was a very large one, and we had a good deal of conversation about books and authors. This was the second governor who had done me the honor to take notice of me, which to a poor boy like me was very pleasing. We proceeded to Philadelphia. I received on the way Vernon's money, without which we could hardly have finished our journey. Collins wished to be employed in some counting-house, but whether they discovered his dramming by his breath or by his behavior, though he had some recommendations, he met with no success in any application, and continued lodging and boarding at the same house with me, and at my expense. Knowing I had that money of Vernon's, he was continually borrowing of me, still promising repayment as soon as he should be in business. At length he had got so much of it that I was distressed to think what I should do in case of being called on to remit it. His drinking continued about which we sometimes quarrelled, for when a little intoxicated he was very fractious. Once in a boat on the Delaware with some other young men he refused to row in his turn. I will be rowed home, says he. We will not row for you, says I. You must or stay all night on the water, says he, just as you please. The others said, Let us row, what signifies it? But my mind being soured with his other conduct, I continued to refuse. So he swore he would make me row, and throw me overboard, and coming along, stepping on the thwarts towards me, when he came up and struck at me, I clapped my hand under his crutch, and, rising, pitched him head foremost into the river. I knew he was a good swimmer, and so was under little concern about him. But before he could get round to lay hold of the boat, we had a few strokes pulled her out of his reach, and ever when he drew near the boat, we asked if he would row, striking a few strokes to slide her away from him. He was ready to die with vexation, and obstinately would not promise to row. However, seeing him at last beginning to tire, we lifted him and brought him home dripping wet in the evening. We hardly exchanged a civil word afterward, and a West Indian captain, who had a commission to procure a tutor for the sons of a gentleman at Barbados, happening to meet with him, agreed to carry him thither. He left me then, promising to remit the first money he should receive in order to discharge the debt, but I never heard of him after. Breaking into this money of Vernon's was one of the first great errata of my life, and this affair showed that my father was not much out in his judgment when he supposed me too young to manage business of importance. But Sir William, on reading his letter, said he was too prudent. There was great difference in persons, and discretion did not always accompany years, nor was youth always without it. And since he will not set you up, says he, I will do it myself. Give me an inventory of the things necessary to be had from England, and I will send for them. You shall repay me when you are able. I am resolved to have a good printer here, and I am sure you must succeed. 
This was spoken with such an appearance of cordiality that I had not the least doubt of his meaning, and what he said, I had hitherto kept the proposition of my setting up a secret in Philadelphia, and I still kept it. Had it been known that I depended on the governor, probably some friend that knew him better would have advised me not to rely on him, as I afterwards heard it was his known character to be liberal of promises which he never meant to keep. Yet, unsolicited as he was by me, how could I think his generous offer insincere? I believed him one of the best men of the world. I presented him an inventory of a little print-house, amounting to my computing to about one hundred pounds sterling. He liked it, but asked me if my being on the spot in England, to choose the types and see that everything was good of the kind, might not be of some advantage. Then, says he, when there you may make acquaintances and establish correspondence in the bookselling and stationery way. I agreed that this might be advantageous. Then, says he, get yourself ready to go with Annis, which was the annual ship and the only one at that time usually passing between London and Philadelphia. But it would be some months before Annis sailed, so I continued working with Keimer, fretting about the money Collins had got from me, and in daily apprehension of being called upon by Vernon, which, however, did not happen for some years after. I believe I have omitted mentioning that in my first voyage from Boston being becalmed off Block Island, our people set about catching cod, and hauled up a great many. Hitherto I had stuck to my resolution of not eating animal food, and on this occasion I considered it with my master, Tyrone, the taking every fish as a kind of unprovoked murder, since none of them had, or ever could, do us any injury that might justify the slaughter. All this seemed to be reasonable, but I had formerly been a great lover of fish, and, when this came hot out of the frying-pan, it smelt admirably well. I balanced some time between principle and inclination, till I reckoned that, when the fish were opened, I saw smaller fish taken out of their stomachs. Then thought I, if you eat one another, I don't see why we mayn't eat you. So I dined upon cod very heartily, and continued to eat with other people, returning now only and then occasionally to a vegetable diet. So convenient a thing is it to be a reasonable creature, since it enables one to find or make a reason for everything one has a mind to do. End of chapter 4